create this webinar today. Um, I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist and simultaneously prior to focusing my work on neuropsychological testing, I did a lot of training in inpatient settings as well as residential programs, outpatient settings, generally for children and teenagers, um, but also some young adults and adult populations as well. Um, mostly focused on being um, a family therapist or an individual therapist. So I actually, um, you know, kind of bring a lens of looking at neuropsych evaluations as a critical kind of first step in determining what type of treatments are appropriate, what type of interventions are most useful for individuals. Um, so I really kind of value and bring that lens of what really works in the trenches kind of what, um, in my experience as a therapist and also working with clients um, outside of the testing setting, what works, right? And what is real life and doable? Um, how can recommendations from neuropsych testing actually reflect what can be done in real life? Um, simultaneously, um, something that I think is really important for me is I come with kind of a background in um, I'm working in an emotion lab when I was younger. Um, and so one of my main focuses is kind of understanding emotion regulation, understanding how the brain and the body experiences emotion. And so one of my kind of main specialties and focuses as a neuropsychologist is how emotion regulation impacts learning, impacts functioning, um, in, impacts our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and within that framework, um, a lot of my testing experience has been assessing individuals on the spectrum, individuals um, who present with social pragmatic challenges. Um, and so one of my kind of main focuses is how do we kind of make sure we're tailoring uh, evaluations that prioritize what a neurodiverse individual brings to the table and also valuing and understanding um, emotion regulation and our emotional experience as crucial to our everyday life. And how do we support that um, skill set in continuing to grow and involving and creating interventions that are appropriate? So today, this webinar, these are the things that we're going to focus on or what we're going to um, kind of the overview, broad picture of what today's webinar is, is going to discuss. And first, I really want to start kind of at, you know, kind of bird's eye view level. What is a neuropsych evaluation? Um, and really hoping that today participants walk away with, you know, what are some potential questions that I might have or that my colleague might have, a coworker, my, you know, my husband, my family member. How do I know that if those are questions that are popping up, um, is this an appropriate time to consider a neuropsych evaluation? And then we'll talk about what a neuropsych evaluation does. How can neuropsych evaluation help individuals? Um, across the lifespan, starting from childhood all the way up to adulthood. Um, and then kind of the, the second main bulk of this presentation is focusing on one aspect of neurodiversity, so individuals who identify with autism spectrum disorders or falling somewhere along the spectrum, right? And I'm going to discuss what the kind of key components of a neuropsych evaluation looks like for individuals um, across the lifespan. And also kind of talk about, in my experience, and also looking at the research, kind of what are some of the limitations that we have based on the tools that we have to diagnose and assess and determine interventions for individuals who identify with autism or Asperger's or whatever label works for people, right? Um, and then within that framework, um, thinking about kind of what, what tools do we have, what's an appropriate kind of um, plan that's in place that a neuropsychologist should use to assess individuals on the spectrum. I'm going to talk about why kind of a flexible, individualized approach to testing is really critical and really crucial and what some of those components would look like. Um, and at the end of the day, walking away with, you know, am I considering a neuropsych evaluation? Do I have um, other people in my life who are considering an eval? What are some questions I could ask a neuropsychologist? Um, you know, I always, whether it be a therapist or a neuropsychologist, right, or, you know, whether we're buying a car, right, I really think about it as a consumer, right? So I want people to walk away thinking about 
what are some questions that I need answered to evaluate if this person is the right fit for me or for my questions, or my needs. Okay. So what is a neuropsych evaluation? Generally speaking, a neuropsych evaluation is an in-depth assessment of skills and abilities that are linked to brain functions or aspects of how our brain works. Also, not only just the pieces of our brain, but how kind of parts of our brain are connected and interact, right? Um, and so at a very basic level, a neuropsych eval is designed to look at skill sets that are associated with brain functioning. And the way we assess that is through administering a series of tests that are standardized or normed, meaning that lots of people have taken these tests and we have an idea of generally how people do, right? Whether it's kind of an average performance, above average, below average on certain tests that we would administer that evaluate specific skills and abilities that are linked to brain functioning. Now, simultaneously, as a practitioner and as a neuropsychologist, something that I think is very crucial and that is also in the literature and, and talked about in terms of best practice for neuropsychological evaluations is the importance of taking what those tests show us, how a person performs on a pencil and paper task, a task that's kind of relatively more hands-on and problem-solving oriented, and integrating what those data points mean with a person's history, with observations of how that experience was for that person taking those tests, um, you know, are, am I observing instances of significant anxiety, for example, that would impact that person's ability to show me what their, you know, verbal skills are in the moment, right, or what their language skills are. And then also importantly, you know, this is very crucial, particularly for younger children and teenagers and thinking about the different contexts that skills are shown outside of an evaluator's office is how is this individual functioning? How is this individual showing their skills outside of my office? And that's usually gathered by people who know that person very well. Now, sometimes for adults, that can also look like having a conversation with a spouse, having a conversation with a caregiver, someone who, you know, kind of day in and day out has a good understanding of what this individual um, is like outside of my office, right? And integrating that information into the data that I'm gathering. Likewise, self-report, right? So there's a number of assessment measures that neuropsychologists use that involve questionnaires, right? And an evaluation of symptoms, inventories that people say, you know, I'm experiencing headaches most times or not often, right? And so making sure that self-report is an integral piece of a neuropsych eval, but also kind of the, I think importantly, the, the conversations that happen when you are going through the different tasks and the different um, activities that I do with children, teenagers, young adults, is you know, what comes up in conversation? What are the things that are important for this person? What are they talking about with me as things that are really hard for them, things that are going well, and how does that integrate with the findings? Okay, so this is my, you know, diagram to show, I think everyone kind of here today is, you know, usually when I see people for the first time in my office, when there's an intake, when we're trying to decide, you know, is this neuropsychological evaluation right for me? There's usually a question, right? There's a question that people are coming in with, whether it be for their child, whether it be for their spouse, whether it be for them themselves. Um, there's a question that kind of feels unanswered, right? Um, and, you know, I've, I think something that also comes up is, We've tried these things, you know, my child's having a hard time with anxiety and we've tried this type of treatment or this therapy um, and it's not working, right? And so there's usually a question that people kind of bring to the table and have, you know, concerns or questions about, right? I think another important piece to this is that I get a number of referrals from families who have also interfaced with other important providers in their life, like a pediatrician, um, you know, a neurologist, an optometrist, their own therapist, right? And those people who are working with um, a client kind of day in and day out also have questions, right? And they might recommend, a neuropsych eval might really help us sort out what type of treatment you need. Um, we might want to think about based on neuropsych eval, you know, what medication adjustments would happen or not. Um, you know, look at other options for treatment. That's definitely kind of a common 
kind of um, secondary question that comes in the door with a client is, you know, I have this important provider in my life and we, we have questions and we need some questions answered. So um, what I've done is I've included kind of some, um, you know, of course there's a million questions, right? And every person, every family is different in terms of what questions they have that would be um, an appropriate question for a neuropsychologist to answer. Um, but I've included kind of what are some of the um, kind of common referral questions or things that come up um, when families come and meet with me for the first time um, and thinking about, you know, is this the right time for a neuropsych evaluation? So I, I categorize them into, you know, children, and we'll talk a little bit about teenagers and adults, right, and some questions that kind of lead to um, clients seeking a neuropsych evaluation. So for children, you know, a number of times I see young preschoolers, for example, where a family has questions about development, right? I'm concerned about my child's language skills, about their sentence speech, right? Um, or my child's having a hard time with walking and kind of seems pretty clumsy and uncoordinated at their age. Um, and so there's a question about development and wanting to assess if what a family or a preschool setting or a pediatrician is seeing is kind of normatively appropriate or if there are perhaps some areas of growth or areas of need that would need to be addressed, right? Um, that's also a time frame where, you know, in terms of developmental skills, it's kind of a, a useful time frame to think about are we able to early detect, you know, a broader kind of developmental process such as autism spectrum disorder, such as, you know, a growing language disorder that might be pretty persis persistent for a child throughout their life. Um, you know, capturing and assessing kind of early signs of um, learning disabilities, for example. Um, other things that are pretty common is, you know, my, my child's acting out, he's having tantrums, she's, you know, really upset when she comes home from school, and we're having a hard time managing her at home with our other kids. Um, other things, you know, we're really concerned, you know, academically, he's doing great, um, but the social piece and kind of his friendships, he doesn't really have that many friends. Um, she's not really able to keep her friends. She keeps getting into fights with her friends, right? So questions about kind of our, our social life and concerns about a child's social functioning. Um, then there's the questions about my child's really struggling in school. You know, we know that she's really bright, but we feel like she's not really showing us her skills or showing us her potential day to day in school. Why is that? What can we do to help her at school to show us what her skills are? Um, oftentimes, like I, you know, had referenced earlier, what type of therapeutic intervention, what type of intervention in general would be appropriate based on this child's learning profile and what you find from a neuropsych eval? Would it be important for the family to be engaged in therapy? Would a child benefit from speech and language therapy to develop language skills, for example? Are there certain medical interventions that would be useful? Okay, so um, these are some kind of common referral questions for teens and I think kind of young adult, college age, um, you know, early kind of college years. Um, one of the kind of common ones that I see pretty frequent is like, my teen is not motivated, right? You know, he was doing really well in school and then he kind of fell off the wagon, right? Or things got really hard in high school and we don't know what's going on. Um, he seems to be struggling more. Um, oftentimes teenagers and their families come in the door and their parents or teachers or pediatricians are saying, have we missed something? You know, is there something that we didn't catch when he was younger or she was younger um, that we need to look at now and that we need to make sure we're providing interventions at this point in time? Um, other things involve, you know, getting ready for college, right? So looking at what types of helpful accommodations would a teenager require in college based on their neuropsych findings and profile. Things such as, you know, making sure they have access to a learning support center when they go to college, right? Um, or talking about kind of what's the plan in place for note taking. If, you know, paying attention to a didactic presentation in college is really challenging, what are some kind of tools and interventions that can help um, a college student perform in school, particularly in college? Um, and you know, teenage years is definitely the time where concerns about depression, 
sadness, self-confidence, irritability. We know that teenagers are at a super high risk of being really depressed and anxious, that that's a really kind of critical time frame where anxiety and depression kind of rear its ugly head, right? And so that's a time frame where I see a lot of kind of emotionally distressed individuals who are trying to figure out, you know, what is, what's happening? Am I experiencing anxiety? Am I becoming depressed? Is this coming from a place of, you know, not being able to manage certain aspects of school, like perhaps I have an undiagnosed learning disability. Um, you know, aspects of feeling like your teenager isn't prepared for college, right? You know, they're not getting up on their own, right? They are having a hard time managing all the assignments that they have for their courses in high school. Um, you know, we're, we're not sure if she wants her driver's license or not, kind of like the growing independence that teens are learning and developing the skills to do so, some concerns around that, right? And wanting to figure out how can we better support and prepare that individual to transition past high school into what the next steps might be, college or otherwise. Um, standardized tests is another kind of common referral where, you know, my child's doing really well with their content in school, and then when we take a test or when she takes a test, you know, she's She's getting a poor grade, right? We don't know why, you know, is that having to do with anxiety, reading comprehension strategies um, that we need to take tests and kind of getting more um, uh, kind of understanding and knowledge around what's, what's driving that difficulty. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we've tried these things, you know, with my teen and things just aren't working and we need some new guidance or a new look at what to help. So then some things in terms of adults and, and reasons that adults would consider um, a neuropsych eval. There's a number of reasons that are pretty broad. So there's definitely a number of adults who pursue a neuropsych evaluation because they're, for example, really concerned about forgetfulness, um, issues, you know, significant issues with memory and kind of daily functioning. That's a, a common kind of um, more medically based referral for individuals who are adults seeking a neuropsych eval. Um, Sometimes, you know, I see adults or I've seen adults who are forgetting things and they're, you know, really tired. They're having a lot of muscle pain, um, a lot of kind of physical symptoms that they're concerned about and they want to understand why, you know, is this because of my mood? Is this because of, you know, something else that might be happening for, happening for me medically? Um, that's kind of a common referral for neuropsych as well. Um, and other things are kind of more related to work and relationships. So, um, you know, adults sometimes come in with, you know, I'm having a hard time with my wife, right, or my partner, right, and this is, you know, something that I feel like is coming from, I'm having a hard time kind of understanding what to do, I'm having a hard time understanding what he or she needs, and there are times when people would seek a neuropsych eval to kind of understand what their learning style is and how they process information, et cetera, and why that might impact their relationship, right? Um, same with work, you know, I'm really struggling to focus on my work, I'm behind in my responsibilities, I'm having a hard time with my coworker, right? Um, these kind of work-related um, issues or concerns and are also kind of a pretty common uh, question that might pop up when we meet for our first session. So, you know, I, I think about with all these referral questions and kind of questions that people come in the door, with that question that they have in mind, which is kind of where we start, where we start with what's your question, what are your concerns, why are you here, right? Um, I think about neuropsych evaluations as what is the way that we determine what your roadmap is for after this evaluation, right? I'm gonna meet with you for a series of appointments, um, we're going to talk perhaps to individuals in your life or important people. Um, I'm going to review your history, right? And with all that information, I want to put it together and I want to figure out not just here's, you know, 80 things that you can do, right? But based on your learning style, how you understand information, what works for your strengths, what is kind of the series of steps that would be important to follow as kind of a, a roadmap for what to do? based on what's challenging or what's a vulnerability that you're running into in life, right? Um, so, you know, I think a good example is there's a child that would really benefit from social skill interventions, right? 
Um, but what type of social skill intervention is appropriate for that child based on, you know, are they more of a verbal learner? Are they more of a visual learner? Um, what types of activities would interest them and engage them? Where are places that that family could look for that might find a group or a social group that's really appropriate or fits well with them, right? And having kind of an individualized approach to what that roadmap of interventions actually looks like. So this is my iceberg metaphor uh, or analogy that I've used prior in, in other presentations that I've done. Um, I like it because I think about, you know, conducting and involving clients in a neuropsych evaluation as, you know, there's a lot of things that people are observing in the world, whether it be themselves who come in for a neuropsych eval or a teacher or a parent saying, this is what we're seeing, right? Um, you know, and at the same time, there's stuff kind of going on underneath the surface, right? And that's not to say in any way, shape, or form, you know, unconscious things, right, things we're not aware of, but rather synthesizing all the data points from important people in that person's life, from the person themselves, from the testing that I conduct, and what the research says about what that learning profile means for a person, and evaluating what does that as a whole picture mean? right? What does that mean based on all this information in terms of how they learn? What if we put all these pieces of the puzzle together? What does that result in, right? Um, so, you know, at the top I have, you know, kind of example of a, a child who, uh, you know, looks kind of frustrated at school, right? And on the other side I have, you know, someone filling out a screener, right, or a questionnaire, right? Which questionnaires are wonderful, right? They are things that we might encounter in schools and pediatrician offices, which are really excellent tools to kind of capture symptoms, capture things that might be perhaps um, different or developmentally different than what would we expect based on a child's age, right? Um, and when I think about neuropsych testing, I think about what are all the other pieces of the puzzle that we can assess through testing, through coordinating all the pieces that take into account what teachers are saying, parents are saying what that person is saying, what's being reported on a screener that's helping us determine if there is a vulnerability or not, and then making sure we have all the pieces of the puzzle to tell us exactly what we have to do and what are the interventions that are most appropriate. So I'll give an example. So, you know, let's call him Eddie, right? So Eddie's in the fourth grade and he is really frustrated when he's sitting at his desk, right? He's having a really hard time focusing, um, his teachers are raising concerns that he doesn't have any friends in school, um, that, you know, his eye contact is kind of off and he's, he seems kind of, you know, disconnected and not really kind of socially engaged. Um, you know, other things that are noticed are, you know, he seems to kind of be always wearing the same shirt all the time, right? Or there's certain types of clothes that he really likes, right? Or that he seems to be really interested in wearing. We don't know why, right? We, we kind of, you know, are, are wondering, right, what is that from? Um, other things are, you know, he's having a hard time at math, he's getting super frustrated, um, you know, things like he's pretty forgetful, right? Um, and, you know, sometimes this frustration can look like having an outburst in class where he gets really upset, right? Um, and so oftentimes, you know, families, whether it be online, right, or kind of in the real world, we fill out questionnaires and we say, okay, you know, these are some of the things my child is showing me. What does this mean, right? What could this possibly be? Um, and this is what I consider kind of the strengths and challenges of kind of these checklists and grading skills that are out there in the world, which I use in neuropsychological evaluations to assess symptoms and to assess functioning as, again, kind of one piece of the puzzle that puts all the pieces together. Um, so if you look at some of these um, uh, um, symptoms or sentences that people would indicate, say a parent or teacher, is this what my child is doing, right? Most of the time, not often, kind of in the middle. Can't get his mind off certain thoughts. He's got some nervous movements twitching. He's picking his nose, his skin. He'd rather be alone than with others. He's having a hard time making friends. Um, you know, he's sleeping last, he's repeating certain acts over and over again, he's having a hard time paying attention. He seems kind of sensitive to sounds and textures. He's pretty rigid and inflexible, and he seems kind of spacey, you know, staring off or gazing off in class, right, or at home. And so you fill out these questionnaires, and 
you get kind of a report that says these are the possibilities, right? And at the end of the day, do we know if based on those responses and symptoms, where is this coming from for Eddie, right? There's so many possibilities. There's so many reasons why those symptoms would be checked, right? To say, yes, these are things that we are observing, that we are concerned about. We want to help Eddie. We want to figure out what's going on, what types of interventions he needs, right? And the reality is, is that, you know, this is just a, a brief list, right, of all the possibilities, right? Is Eddie really stressed? Did he just move to a new school and he's having a hard time, right? Does Eddie also or not have um, an underlying language disorder that has these diagnosis effects to his ability to socialize and to communicate what he needs to other peers? Is he experiencing anxiety, right? Is there underlying physical symptoms that he's experiencing, such as hearing loss, right? All these possibilities can result in, you know, a yes, right, to many of those questions. And that's why looking deeper kind of at the, the, the other layers of the iceberg, right, with that analogy that we're using, is how neuropsych evaluations can tease out and determine what are we looking at, right? And we care about that because that determines what is going to work, right, and what are potential avenues of support at school, outside of school, they're going to help Eddie based on what's going on with him, right? Okay. So, you know, I've said this many times, right? So I think of neuropsych evaluations as the whole picture, right? Taking all the pieces of data that have already been gathered, um, looking at observations and parent and teacher report, individual self-report, um, and determining if we put all that together with the test the activities and the standardized assessments that we have to look at how you process information, how you learn, what that means about your functioning, what does that tell us? What is kind of the whole picture um, diagnosis, whole picture learning style that would then guide what interventions we would um, recommend? So these are um, kind of an overview of the key components of a neuropsych evaluation, right? Um, and these in, involve skills such as looking at IQ or intelligence, your problem solving skills, planning and abstract thinking, your attention span, your ability to kind of learn and retain information and hold on to information, your memory systems, which are intricately related to learning, um, language skills, right? Both at, in terms of your expressive capacities, your receptive, your understanding of language, as well as kind of the social communication, social pragmatics of language. Um, you know, taking a, a deeper dive at your visual spatial perception, your motor behaviors, your sensory skills, um, fine motor skills, gross motor skills. And then these things that I bolded at the end, I bold because um, there are definitely some neuropsych evaluations that perhaps may not include a review of academic skills, right? Pending age, developmental status, you know, if I'm working with an adult, um, you know, who's working, of course, versus, you know, a young child that's struggling in school, that might determine to what extent I dive into your academic skills and academic learning skills. And then, of course, there are areas of social and emotional development that, pending what the referral question is or what the questions are, some neuropsych evals may not perhaps um, kind of dive more deeply into those areas of them. Similarly with adaptive skills, which I'll talk about later. Um, so adaptive thinking about kind of the real life skills that you use day to day to function in the world, like daily living skills, you know, safety awareness, um, you know, your communication, you know, with other people in the community. Um, that is also kind of an important component of a neuropsych eval for certain referral questions, for example, determining if an individual is falling somewhere on the autism spectrum, right, um, or kind of determining what types of services would be appropriate for a person. Um, and then lastly, you know, I, I bold kind of the strengths and assets portion of this. And for me as a practitioner, this is kind of a, a crucial component for neuropsych evals is that, yes, we want to answer questions and we want to help. We want to figure out what's the roadmap for interventions based on vulnerabilities and needs. Um, but also we want to determine what this individual's strengths are, how they learn, right? What are they good at? 
what does that mean in terms of what information is going to be more accessible to them? What information is going to be harder for them in school? What does that mean about, you know, their friendships and their ability to sustain friendships? Um, I see that as definitely, you know, a core component that, you know, we, I would hope that would be a, a core piece of what any neuropsych eval contains, right? Um, okay, so I've discussed this kind of in whole picture terms prior, but, you know, what, are we, what do you do with a neuropsych report once it's complete, right? So um, standardly, you know, at the end of a neuropsych evaluation, you're provided a written report of findings and recommendations based on those findings. I think that neuropsych evals at a very kind of top level process is a way of understanding either my own or my relatives, childs, et cetera, what their challenges are, what their strengths are, what those look like across different settings at home, school, work, et cetera. Therefore determining what the appropriate treatments are or the appropriate approaches that would be helpful for that individual to feel more happy and confident, whatever the you know, refer referral question is. Um, I also think about you know, the importance of neuropsych evals having really relevant and individualized resources, right? So there's definitely some times where neuropsych evals kind of give that cookie cutter recommendations of here's like 72 books for you to read about ADHD, right? Or here's 72 books for you to read about autism, right? And I think that it's really critical, and I very much prioritize in my evals for what specific book that there's a million wonderful books that are useful for parents, useful for individuals, might be really useful for this person based on their learning style, based on their strengths, right? Um, what specific social group, like I mentioned before, which, what specific community support group, right, would be an appropriate fit for this individual. Um, particularly for children, teenagers, and young adults, um, neuropsych evals are pretty crucial for IEP development or an individualized education program, um, kind of planning, 504 plans for determining what are the kind of areas of need that, my, that this child or this teen is demonstrating in testing that demands kind of interventions within school, right? So that's definitely a common kind of um, result or use of a neuropsych eval. Similarly, you know, supporting transition planning for high schoolers, um, you know, thinking about what does transition planning look like? What's this person's, you know, vision for their future? What are they thinking about? What are some options for post high school, right? And prioritizing in the neuropsych eval that this is really important for this person, right? That we have to start working on this now rather than later. Um, and for adults, you know, what could be useful in the work setting, right? Um, providing recommendations around allowing or, you know, supporting an individual in their work setting, having access to breaks, perhaps having and sorting out how to have a more adjustable work schedule, um, you know, specialized tools that can be used for project management or task management um, in, you know, work settings like assistive tech, things such as speech to text technology and, you know, pens that kind of take notes while you're taking notes, right? An audio record for you. What are those kind of tools that would be useful in a work setting? So now I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to discuss the key components of what I consider a neuropsych evaluation for autism spectrum disorders, right? Um, thinking across, you know, the broad spectrum, right? And thinking about how does neuropsych evaluation support neurodiversity, right? And I, I took this from AANE's website because I like this um, definition of what neurodiversity is to talk about this. It's the idea that neurological differences like autism, dyslexia, and ADHD are the result of normal natural variations in the human genome. This represents a new and fundamental different way of looking at conditions or traditionally pathologized. Um, and you know, this is a term that has definitely um, luckily become more prevalent and more kind of ingrained in how um, providers, how individuals in the world are talking about um, autism spectrum disorders, other diagnoses such as ADHD, dyslexia, learning disabilities, etc. Um, and trying to really focus on, you know, this is a way of learning, this is a way of thinking. And I think about a neuropsych eval as one of kind of the crucial tools that allows for 
both myself and more importantly, the individual or the family to understand how this person learns some things, what are their strengths, right? Not just what's a, you know, label that we can call this, you know, this kind of more traditional kind of pathologized history, right? But instead, what does this learning style mean for this person? How does this person view the world, right? And I think that that is doable and accessible in a comprehensive neuropsych eval that values that neurodiversity, right? And value, values that construct and that reality as crucial, right? Um, so these are some of the tenets that I have developed um, as I'm talking about kind of neurodiversity and assessing neurodiverse populations. And specifically, as we're going to talk about, um, you know, kind of the formalized assessments we have for assessing individuals on the spectrum. Um, I think about the importance of capturing the challenges, capturing the strengths. What's the snapshot of how this person learns? How does this person view the world? What matters to them? What are the things that are really challenging for them right now and why? What are the things that they're doing well with? And, you know, simultaneously, what does this label mean for this person? And I think in my experience as a practitioner, you know, that's highly dependent on the person. It's highly dependent on the context, right? So there's aspects of life in terms of how to diagnoses, delineate services, provide crucial interventions that an individuals need. And then there is the person level of what does this label mean for this person? What's its usefulness? Um, similarly, you know, thinking about the labels and, you know, the kind of diagnostic categories that we use to capture strengths and challenges um, in neuropsych evals is what are kind of the implications of that diagnosis, both in terms of kind of a familial and a cultural context and what this means for a person's worldview. Um, and I don't know, just to recommend a wonderful book. Um, so it's called The Spirit Catches You When You Fall Down by Ann Fadiman. Some of you may have read this. Um, it's an older book, um, but it's a wonderful book about um, a Hmong family in California who, you know, is kind of going through this process of their child having a seizure disorder, a diagnosis of a seizure disorder. And in the family and in Hmong culture, individuals who experience seizures are viewed as very powerful and having a number of strengths, um, having in many ways kind of shamanistic qualities, right? And then simultaneously, we have, you know, in this story, you know, the medical profession and the, you know, the realities of medication management for seizures, right? And seizure disorder and, you know, interventions for seizures, right? And so it's a great book that kind of illustrates how does, how do doctors, how do nurses, how do, you know, social workers and providers kind of work with this family around what this means, right? And how do we kind of, you know, tolerate and value this, this both and perspective of what some of the challenges are that this little girl is encountering, but also what the strength of this diagnosis means for this family. So, you know, this I think is just an important kind of, um, to think about when we start talking about assessing autism spectrum disorders and neuropsych evals. Um, definitely, we know diagnosing autism spectrum disorders is a challenging thing to do. You want to make sure that you have a provider who has extensive experience doing so and has been really trained. Um, and that's often because a lot of the symptoms and the experiences of in individuals on the spectrum can also overlap with other things, right, with other experiences. And so we want to make sure that we're, you know, prioritizing and using the tools that we have and using the flexible assessments that we have to diagnose ASD in the most accurate way. Um, and, you know, the diagnostic criteria leaves a lot to clinician discretion in many ways. Um, when you look at what the criteria is, you know, compared to when you go to the doctor and you can get a blood test around your diabetes level, right, for example, we're talking about a very different assessment, a very different evaluation which means there's much more variability, there's much more flexibility in what and how we diagnose autism, right, compared to these blood tests that, right, we might have for other things. Um, and so therefore, you know, making sure your neuropsychologist has extensive experience doing so is crucial. I included this just to um, include some kind of factual information about the National Research Council. Um, they have um, provided and given guidelines on how providers, neuropsychologists, et cetera, 
should be assessing individuals, particularly children with autism spectrum disorders. Um, you know, and one of the things that they focus on is assessing multiple areas of functioning, including adaptive skills, which we'll talk about, appreciating, appreciating, appreciating the variation in ability and performance, and the use of a developmental perspective. You know, is this symptom that we're seeing, you know, my child's having a hard time playing with other peers, is that age appropriate because that child is playing a certain way at two versus a child who's playing that way at nine, right, and having a developmental perspective? Generally speaking, there is less established research and formalized procedures for diagnosing ASDs in adults. There's definitely a number of researchers, a number of, kind of strategies and, and formalized tools that we have. Um, we just have less information than we do for kids and adolescents. So um, this is kind of a broad overview for if I were to conduct neuropsych evaluation for evaluating the possibility of an autism spectrum disorder. What are the core components? First and foremost, a detailed history, right? What does this person bring to the table? What's their functioning now and prior, right? Um, I also prioritize an observation of the individual across settings, right? And there are times where um, that tenant and that kind of model is doable, whether that be me going and seeing this person at school, right, or outside in the community. It can also be other things like, having a really detailed interview with a caregiver, with a parent, with a teacher around how does this person present, right, at school um, or at home. Um, you know, and making sure collateral contact to assess what a child or a teen or an adult's social functioning is outside of my office is crucial. And then we have these domains, which are the direct tasks or the way that we are assessing aspects of abilities and skills, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, that are associated with brain function, cognition, our learning skills, our communication skills. We have gold standard measures of autism spectrum disorder, which I'll discuss, as well as measures to look um, more deeply at some aspects of social emotional skills and applied life skills or adaptive skills. So um, I'm in this webinar not going to discuss kind of the different measures that we would use to look at IQ, memory, academic skills, attention, executive functioning, or the kind of organizer and planning problem solving part of our brain. Um, but what I did include is what those kind of skills, when we measure those with different tests that we have, what are some questions that we would discover and could answer that also comes from a very strength based perspective, right? Are you a ver verbal learner? Are you more of a visual learner? Do you learn by taking in auditory information or do you need to see through visuals, right? Do you learn by observing or do you learn by actually doing something, right? Are you more of a black and white concrete thinker or you do you think kind of in this more gray abstract zone, right? Do you think in pictures or words? Why are multi-step tasks harder for me compared to tasks that are pretty much straightforward and I have the rules of what I'm supposed to do? Am I more of a big picture or detail-oriented thinker? Do I have a difficulty with language or aspects of crossing the visual world, right? And what does that mean for me in my life? Um, you know, and what are my executive functioning skills, right? How am I doing at organizing and planning my life for work, organizing and planning my life for my family, you know, for school? Um, and, you know, for example, you know, sometimes it's as, you know, kind of straightforward is, do I need more time? I have all these thoughts and these important bright ideas to share to get my thoughts out in writing, right? Or to get my thoughts out verbally, right? Being able to put language to those types of learning styles is one of the benefits of a neuropsych cell. So um, in terms of neuropsych evals, they also look at, um, you know, and in my evaluations, one of the things that I prioritize, particularly when we are looking at the possibility of evaluating an autism spectrum disorder is your language skills and your communication skills, right? Those include your expressive and your receptive skills, your listening, expressing skills, um, but also aspects of grammar and syntax, you know, putting words together, right? On paper or orally, right? Um, formulating sentences, storytelling, telling a sequenced idea or a sequenced story of what's happening in your life. Um, we also have tests not only to assess those aspects of language, but of social language and pragmatics, which will also go into a, um, a more detail and kind of social cognition and how we look at that and social problem solving a bit later. 
Um, but one of the things that we assess is non-literal language, right? So, you know, I include, you know, dogs and cats. It's raining cats and dogs. I'm going to hit the hay, right? And I'm evaluating developmentally, are there individuals where that type of kind of abstract, you know, figurative language is a harder thing for them to understand and process or not? That's definitely a crucial component of looking at your language skills. Then we have the adaptive functioning or applied life skills, which again, I've mentioned prior and is mentioned in the National Research Council's guidelines and kind of how we should be assessing autism, right, as a possibility. Um, so adaptive functioning is critical, particularly because it can help delineate kind of what the severity level and the service delivery looks like for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Um, adaptive functioning skills, are critical for post-secondary transition planning, so life after high school, right, your community skills, your safety awareness, your ability to organize and plan your life through a calendar, right, um, and importantly, adaptive functioning skills are what an individual does in real life independently, not what they're capable of. So these are questionnaires that are usually completed by a caregiver, a teacher, someone who knows the person very well, with a series of questions and skills. And importantly, you know, the questions are geared at, you know, this person can do it, right, but can they do it independently most of the time, or do they need a lot of help, a lot of support? Because we want to assess what are the skills that this person needs a lot of support for right now, and do we need to build their independence in showing us those skills in order to function in the real world? So those adaptive functioning measures measure things like practical skills, social skills, conceptual skills, I mentioned safety awareness, also Self-care skills, you know, showering, um, brushing your teeth, also, you know, making a small meal when you're hungry, knowing how to use appliances in the kitchen, communication skills, like in the community, are you able to order, you know, something at a restaurant, right? Um, work skills and community skills, like can you express your ideas in an email, right, or in writing? Those are areas of function we want to assess to determine are there skills that we would want to delineate as crucial for kind of building this person's sense of self-agency and independence in functioning in the world. So then another aspect of neuropsych evaluations is emotional functioning and getting an assessment of how an individual experiences emotions and if there are any signs that this person is experiencing clinically significant or have more severe symptoms of diagnoses such as anxiety, depression, instances of trauma, PTSD, mood instability, behavioral challenges, aggression, OCD, right? Um, all these kind of mental health concerns that we would want to evaluate and determine if this is a piece of the puzzle, right? Um, in neuropsych evals, this is mostly done through self-report, both um, with questionnaires, like we've discussed, as well as, you know, informal interview when testing, behavioral observations, you know, what are the things I'm noticing while this person is going through this testing? Are they really, really tired? Do they appear really anxious? Do they feel really distracted? Um, as well as kind of other reports from collateral information, whether that be a parent or me having a conversation with an adult therapist, right, about what their functioning emotionally is right now. Um, we have some standardized measures that can provide some data for emotional functioning. Um, such as affect recognition is a test for young children, um, looking at kind of an individual's capacity to identify and discriminate between different feeling states. Um, and a large part of evaluating emotional functioning is rested on, again, the real world experience of that person or the people who are in that person. I'm gonna say um, some information and provide some information about projective or performance-based performance testing because this type of testing is sometimes included within a neuropsych evaluation. Now, importantly, I have specialized training and expertise in projective or performance-based testing, which I will describe. Um, there are many providers who do not have experience providing this form of testing, and so it's very crucial that, you know, finding a provider who has this experience and this special expertise is crucial should this be an appropriate um, kind of next step for um, a neuropsych eval or something that would be appropriate based on the referral question. So at a very broad level, projective or performance-based tests can include things like the Rorschach inkblot test, the Rorschach performance assessment system, 
is our most up-to-date scoring and interpretation model for the Rorschach. Um, this RPAS organization and researchers, which I'm trained in, they have done amazing research that has basically updated all of the norms or the information we had for how to interpret the Rorschach and what it means for individuals based on their responses to the Rorschach. Um, and it's actually um, a database that's international, um, which is actually pretty rare. And it's pretty wonderful that we have a test that has consolidated norms from different countries across the world. Um, other aspects of projective performance day tests are things like storytelling tasks. So there's a picture on the screen of, you know, perhaps an individual who's getting bullied. Um, and these are usually pictures that elicit a story or a child or a teen or someone to tell a story about what's happening in this picture. What's this person thinking? What are they feeling? To get an understanding of how they describe thoughts and other things involve, you know, sentence completion, you know, finish this sentence with how you're feeling right now or what's the first thing that comes to mind for various sentences. Then we have personality inventories that some of you may have heard of, such as the MMPI, the PAI. These are lengthy inventories that, are, that help us determine clinical symptoms, such as depression, anxiety, bipolar symptoms, um, schizophrenic sy symptoms. And at the same time, um, these personality inventories have patterns um, that are associated with certain personality disorders or certain personality styles. Now, um, at the bottom of this slide, I include this link because um, I wrote a blog about what projective testing is, why I think it's important, why I think it can be very useful for certain individuals. So I included that here if you're interested in taking a kind of deeper dive and look at this. Um, but very simply, I wanted to describe kind of a performance-based task. What does that mean? What, what is that? Um, the performance-based task requires a person to perform a task that has little structure, direction, or guidance. Okay, so the analogy that I will use for this is, you know, let's say you are a quarterback for a football team, right? And you tell everyone that you are the best quarterback of all time. You are awesome. You do great at all the things you have to do, right? You make the plays, you get touchdowns, etc. And then you have another quarterback who says, you know, I'm the worst quarterback of all time. I just, I am really having a bad season. Nothing is going well. I'm not doing well at any of my plays, etc. A performance-based test you know, if we had this kind of performance-based test for football players, this is the data, right? The data is, okay, how is this person's pass interference, right? How are their pass completions? What are their touchdown numbers? How many times are they getting sacked, right? And all the things that go into what makes a good quarterback, right? So it's looking at the football players or the quarterback's performance in the game to say, is this reflective of their skills, right? And what does it mean for the person who says, I'm a terrible quarterback? right? But yet they're showing us that they're a really good quarterback, right? Sometimes people aren't even aware of what the strengths are. They are actually doing something well. And what does it mean for the person that says, I am the greatest quarterback of all time, but at the same time, we're not seeing that. That performance isn't there. That would determine what type of interventions would be useful for that individual. Similarly, outside of football, right, in the real world, um, Performance-based testing evaluates how this person is doing something in action or in the moment. What are your kind of natural habits, brain habits is what I like to call them, of how you behave in the world, how you think? Are you the person that kind of keeps everything inside? It's like, I'm fine, I'm good. Or are you the person that just like easily explodes, right? And kind of, it's kind of, you know, something sets you off and you're suddenly exploding, right? Those are two different coping styles, two different ways of um, experiencing Performance-based tests, therefore, can also give us this, a look at, based on your coping style and how you experience emotions, how does it impact your self-esteem, your ways of relating to other people, your life in the world in general? Um, projective testing, um, there's definitely kind of important considerations about considering projective testing. Common referrals can be related to um, what the RPAS has really excellent validity around, which are things like psychosis, trauma and attachment, treatment resistant, depression, anxiety, personality patterns, high risk behaviors such as substance use and suicidal thinking. And again, can help with kind of determining based on how this person copes with emotions, 
what are what is an accurate or an appropriate treatment plan for them and as i referenced determine their strengths a lot of strengths come out and are shown in a lot of the research and the data points that we have from projective testing like capacity for empathy perspective taking imagination ability to engage in a therapeutic relationship and at the same time you know it's important to consider that projective testing is not for everyone right um, we have limited research on providing or giving projective tests, such as the Rorschach, for example, for individuals who might have, you know, below average IQ or low vision um, or poor visual, spatial, kind of understanding the nonverbal world skills. Um, and so importantly, you need a trained provider who has experience delivering this testing um, with expertise in delivering projective testing to make the determination of is this the right time and is this the right person for projective and projective testing should always, like other aspects of testing, be integrated with other test data. Okay, so I'm going to now talk about social cognition and social problem solving. These are aspects, especially if we are conducting an evaluation to determine if an individual is, is or should be diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder that we want to evaluate. These tests are also useful for understanding, you know, kids who are very anxious or, you know, teenagers who are very anxious, um, depressed, and how that emotional distress can impact these skills, right? So some of the tests that we have are the social language development tests, the comprehensive assessment of spoken language, the PASP2, and the tests of pragmatic language. And these tests measure things such as social problem solving skills, you know, questions and examples about resolving arguments, providing supportive statements to people in the workplace, how would you phrase it, what would you say, interpreting social language such as, you know, understanding sarcasm, understanding humor, understanding jokes, tests that look at perspective taking, and inferences, or based on this situation, what can you infer about what just happened prior or happened next, as well as multiple interpretations, also known as flexible thinking, or what are some possibilities for what could be happening in this situation? What could, are some possibilities about how this person's feeling or thinking based on what you see? Um, we also have, so something I will mention is um, Michelle Garcia Winner has a double interview, which is an informal assessment of social communication. And I have used Winner's double interview frequently in evaluations that I've conducted. Um, and it was designed as kind of a way to, to measure um, intervention effectiveness, so kind of a baseline of what a, an individual, particularly with Asperger's, what their um, baseline social skills are like, and then providing an intervention and seeing, you know, for young kids and teens, for example, if there's change or growth in those skills over time. Um, and it involves kind of an interview format where I interview the child or the teen, um, I then provide pictures about myself, and um, the teen then interviews me. And as an evaluator, you're kind of assessing what that social exchange looks like qualitatively, right? And that can be an excellent kind of in vivo, in the moment assessment of fluid social communication. I included a picture just to illustrate what I'm talking about in terms of this social language and social pragmatic, social problem solving um, concept that we're measuring that I'm discussing. So for example, for some of these tests, you might be given a picture such as this, right? And I might ask you, you know, this girl sitting at the desk in the pink shirt, tell me what she's thinking and tell me what you see that tells you that what she's thinking, right? Um, or, you know, let's look at this person in the back, this girl with the purple shirt. Um, what is she thinking? How do you know that's what she's thinking? Querying and understanding, you know, what are some aspects of nonverbal communication that people could explain based on this? They give you signs that this is, you know, this person seems upset or this person might feel isolated and they wanted to join the game and they couldn't join the game, right? Similarly, here's another, um, another photo to illustrate, you know, flexible thinking or multiple interpretations. And, you know, let's give you a scene and say, okay, this person in the back here, you know, this, um, this guy on the bike in the back, what are two things that he could possibly be thinking? One is, Oh, I really got to catch up to these guys, right? I want to get up there, right? And the other might be, I'm kind of tired, you know, I'm going to just kind of lean back and stay back here, right? So there's different ways of kind of viewing and interpreting what's happening in a situation 
um, we want to assess that cognitive, um, that social cognitive skill to see if that's something that's challenging for people that perhaps would impact their social communication or their flexibility in social interaction. So we have gold standard measures for autism spectrum disorders. Um, some of you on this webinar may have um, either um, been administered an ADOS-2 or know someone who has received an ADOS-2. Um, the ADOS is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, second edition. And this is a standardized measure with lots of research on determining if an indiv individual falls on the autism spectrum. Measure of communication, social interaction, play, and restricted and repetitive behaviors. Um, it's normed for individuals aged 12 months to adulthood. They have different formats that are based on individual's level of language. Um, and administering and providing the ADOS to require special training to administer it for it, to interpret what it means. And like all of the measurements that we have and that we've been talking about, it is not sufficient for a diagnosis without other data to support that, right? Um, and similarly, you know, that's true like we were talking about with projective testing or, you know, rating scales like we were talking about prior. Again, this is where the whole picture of putting all the puzzle pieces together in neuropsych comes in. Um, the ADOS-2 is supposed to be kind of a social world rather than a test. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of activities, there's a lot of conversations that I am taking notes and observing and um, tracking how individuals are behaving socially across different tasks that we have data um, in terms of how does an individual with autism perform on this task versus an individual um, who does not have an autism spectrum disorder. Um, there are other gold standard measures for autism spectrum disorders that are diagnostic interviews or pretty lengthy questionnaires for caregivers um, that you also need training um, and expertise to um, administer and to ask the questions and assess um, what the symptoms are. And those include the CARS, the Child Autism Rating Scale, um, and the Autism Diagnostic Interview Revised. There are um, also a number of Autism Spectrum Disorders Rating Scales. Um, and these are kind of different than these lengthy diagnostic interview questionnaires that I was just discussing, the CARS and the ADIR. These are shorter questionnaires that can be completed by caregivers. There's also a version for the SRS that's for adults, um, both child and adult. And um, again, remembering the importance of how do we take what's being reported for symptoms on these rating scales, and similar to the ADOS and what we just discussed, should be incorporated with other data to provide a diagnosis. Um, to give you an understanding or just a look at some of the skills and behaviors that are obsessed for, assessed, for example, in the ADOS, when I administer the ADOS, um, these depend on developmental stage, right? So, you know, we're doing make-believe joint interactive play with a five-year-old, and if I'm providing or giving an ADOS to, you know, a 20-year-old, we're not doing make-believe joint interactive play. Um, you know, looking at point attention, use of body language, gestures to communicate a message, um, storytelling skills, spontaneous offering of information. Um, if individuals kind of become stuck or perseverative on discussing an interest or something that they're interested in, um, if there's interest in repetitive topics, as well as thinking about, you know, especially for the for the older individuals discussing emotions, discussing work relationships, friendships, getting a sense of their insight into their relationships and how they feel about social relationships at this point in their lives, if they're having difficulties or don't identify difficulties, as well as assessing, and in a very research validated way on the ADOS, what are some of the conversational skills that people are demonstrating? Eye contact, using body gestures or you know, uh, body language or gestures, following a lead or a conversational lead that I offer and kind of carrying that social chit chat exchange, um, as well as if, if I observe any sensory behaviors, either becoming overstimulated or focused. So importantly, you know, I, I feel like I've, I've referenced this a few times, diagnosis is about functioning in the world, right? And it's never just about what these test scores are. It's never about one test and what it says. Um, they are meant to be incorporated, even the gold standard measures, 
into a thorough evaluation. Um, and importantly, you need collateral information about real life skills and detailed history. Um, you know, and I, I think about social emotional issues as this, you know, this bomb of mixture of things, right? So if we're looking at a child's or a teen's or an adult's social skills, perhaps how emotional issues interact with that or not, um, that is a challenging area to assess, right? It's not kind of cookie cutter. Things aren't kind of divided into, you know, this blood test for this, this blood test, right? It's all mixed together. And so it involves a very kind of detailed, comprehensive look at all the possible factors. So, um, lastly, you know, I, I wanted to include some confounds about neurodiverse evaluations, right? Um, importantly, questionnaires can miss autism spectrum disorders, like we had referenced with her, um, you know, looking even at Eddie's profile, right? Is it possible that Eddie might have had an autism spectrum disorder? Possibly, right? But we don't know until we do, um, you know, kind of a thorough eval of his skills. Um, because, you know, autism spectrum disorders can mirror symptoms, right? And we are oftentimes relying on past or retrospective report, particularly for adult populations, right? Or adults who come in for testing on early developmental history, right? And that's a long time to remember, right? And so that makes this a pretty um, detailed, complex process, right? Um, Social pragmatic language tests, like the ones I was showing you, the social language development test, you know, um, aspects of the castle, looking at, you know, humor and sarcasm and, you know, flexible thinking, those can also miss individuals with autism spectrum disorders, right? Because there are many individuals who are really good at, they're super bright people who know the social rules, right? But it's never diff, never less difficult to kind of fluidly do all those social rules day to day. That's something I run into pretty frequently in my practice. Um, there's definitely, you know, difference between how an individual performs on the ADOS 2 in the office versus what their social functioning is like outside of my office. And that's where the collateral report really matters. Emotional challenges, like if someone is really depressed and anxious, that's going to impact your performance on a gold standard measure of, of a interview social you know world that we're creating that might not be, be because you have autism spectrum disorder but might be because you're really depressed or really anxious right and so we want all the pieces to figure that out there's also a gap in reliable as an evidence based pro, evidence based um, process for diagnosing particularly adults and as we know which this emerging important research that we are in the field looking at is that girls and women and also individuals who identify as non-binary or gender fluid, that that population of individuals are getting missed, right? There are individuals that we're diagnosing later that have been missed as young children, right? And are experiencing perhaps more challenges as adults, right? And so we don't have a really good solid tool or process of assessing those populations. And I use this as an example. We won't go through, you know, kind of all these pieces. Um, but, you know, just in my own practice and looking at the research that's out there around, you know, the lost girls, right, or the invisible girls that were kind of missing, right, with autism, that is because a large part of our diagnostic criteria, a large, most of our amount of research that we have is focused on male populations and male participants. So we have less understanding of what an autism spectrum disorder profile might look like for a girl with autism. We have made progress in that area, but yet we don't have kind of the tools and the formal assessments that have caught up with the research, right? Um, you know, so I see a number of girls who the referral is you know, they're really sad and anxious, right? I see a high school girl and, you know, she's having a hard time at school. She's, you know, exploding at home, right? And a more kind of detailed look at her history and her development over time and, you know, a closer clinical interview with her leads us to discover, huh, I think we've missed something, right? I think we've missed something that, you know, might have been present when she was younger and now we're here and this is why this is contributing to why she's so sad and why she's struggling in school she's you know a common thing and this is in the literature too is just being exhausted right of being exhausted and tired of kind of mapping 
figuring out how to respond to someone in a social exchange, right? And that's something we have in the research. There's also research about girls who might present with some sort of eating patterns and that perhaps being associated with um, an undiagnosed autism spectrum disorder. So this is definitely an area of growing edges and growing research that we need more tools, we need more information to be able to more accurately diagnose girls and young women. Um, and so that's why, you know, I use that example of describing and positing in my practice why having a flexible assessment that right doesn't just rest on what gold standard measures we have. What does the ADOS say? What does the CAR say? What's that score, right? But also looking at an individual's functioning in the real world, right? And that includes history, extensive review of a person's records, right? Looking at their real life skills, talking with people who know them. Um, you know, I think having a very focused, detailed clinical interview about friendships and interests is particularly crucial for evaluating the possibility of an autism or an undiagnosed autism spectrum disorder for a girl or young, young women. Um, I've also conducted home observations, school or classroom observations to kind of get a sense of what's this per what is this person like outside my office, right? What do their skills look like in vivo? Um, In-depth review, I have had, you know, clients who bring in, you know, a home movie of how this teenage was when they were playing with Susie when they were in kindergarten, right? And taking the time to really dig and dive into these critical aspects of assessing the possibility of undiagnosed autism spectrum disorder, I, I see as critical and really crucial in having this flexibility outside of these kind of gold standard tests that we and as well as kind of, you know, community and college campus observations, that's something that can be useful, particularly for, again, this transition age of high school level skills and how that's going to tr perhaps transfer to college or other settings, right? Getting a sense of what their community skills are like when they go to, you know, get a coffee at a local coffee shop. Can they do that, right? Um, looking at social interactive skills in that context can be really informative of how this person is experiencing social life day to day. Um, and that connects to kind of the flexibility around looking at perhaps a more focused transition evaluation and determining kind of what a person's skills are now and what their vision is for the future, um, to kind of focus and hone in on that aspect of their functioning um, to most helpful in a, in a very kind of targeted way saying, this is what's crucial to them right now in the real world, right? Um, you know, in some ways we don't care what they're, you know, if they have great reading comprehension on your neuropsych test, we care about if they can, you know, function in the world and, you know, get a job, right? All the things that matter, let's refocus in assessing those skills to determine what supports their community. Um, so lastly, you know, this is kind of a summary, um, and I know these slides will be available after this webinar for people to view. Um, you know, when you're seeking a neuropsychologist, particularly for individuals who identify with autism, identify with Asperger's, or there's a question of if there is an undiagnosed autism spectrum disorder, um, you know, finding a neuropsychologist who, of course, is highly trained in the measure of success, but also flexible, right, and has this mindset of, you know, these tools we have aren't everything. We need to be flexible and kind of real world getting to know this person outside of my office. Assessing multiple domains of functioning, synthesizing what that means, um, and focused on what are these individual roadmap recommendations for this person, right? Not necessarily the cookie cutter, right? But what are, what are the books that matter to me? What are the groups that would help me? What type of therapy should I consider? Are there certain community agencies that would be a good fit for me based on my interests? Um, I know that AANE, you know, itself has a wonderful directory of experienced providers um, that you could consult and kind of looking at where some neuropsychologists are in my area that, you know, have experience assessing individuals um, who identify on the spectrum or there's a question of, of the spectrum. Um, you know, I also see families where talking with an educational advocate, their physician, right, or a therapist that they know really well that they trust, and making sure you're kind of using those supports that you might already have in place to determine 
you know, do you have any recommendations for a place to look or a provider that you have interacted with or have experience with that would be a good fit based on my question? And I will leave with this, which is these are some kind of, I think, helpful questions um, to ask a neuropsychologist in that first meeting or even on the phone. If you're, you know, I sometimes have phone consultations with individuals where, you know, we talk through kind of presenting concerns and if I would be a good fit for um, a neuropsych eval based on the referral question. Um, you know, what's your approach to testing? Is there flexibility in conducting observations outside of the office setting? Um, you know, are you a provider who would speak to, you know, my therapist or my child's, you know, speech and language pathologist who's known him for years, right? Is that flexible? Is that doable in your evaluation? Because I think that's really important. What do your recommendations look like? What is your experience working with individuals who have autism spectrum disorders, right? Or Asperger's or identify with a neurodiverse profile? Um, What's your training experience in delivering or administering the ADOS-2 or other assessments? Same with projected testing. What's your approach to identifying and assessing social and emotional functioning? Uh, because I mentioned, I think that's kind of an area of testing that involves a lot of corroborating data, involves looking at things from different angles. How does that provider approach that? Um, and questions like, you know, what if my child has a hard time engaging in this testing process? What should I tell my teenager or my child about what this is going to look like? What, what are, how do I answer their questions about why they're coming to see you, right? I think those are important questions to also determine kind of how does this neuropsychologist view this process? What is this process going to mean for the person who is participating and providing all these, you know, important skills and um, inventories that we're looking at? What does this mean for the person who's actually doing it? And how does a neuropsychologist view the testing process for the child, for the teen, for the young adult, so that it is a positive, strength-based process, because I firmly believe that that is a crucial component for how we make neuropsychological evaluations not only valid and appropriate, but also real-life applicable to what this person needs and what's going to help them day to day. And that is all I have for you guys. Thank you so much. I'd be happy to take any questions. Wow, Renee, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. That was so clear and so thorough and extremely helpful, um, at least to me. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you. you. That was fantastic. And if there are any questions, we can hang for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. At the bottom of your screen, you should have a Q&A feature. Um, if the little icon has a, a Q on it. Um, there's also a chat feature, and you can use either to ask a question or give feedback. I know sometimes it takes a second. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think you did such a great job explaining everything, honestly, that there's probably not going to be any questions. <laughs> yeah, that is the goal. That is the goal. <laughs> That's a good thing, yes. <laughs> Sometimes okay. questions pop up after, right? And that's also totally fine. You know, that's when, true. That yeah. is true. Okay. Well, if there are no questions, I'm going to let Renee go. Um, thank you so very much. Truly so helpful. And I really appreciate you taking the time to do this for us. And um, again, like I said, just so extremely helpful. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye, Bye. now.